Well, hello everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live. It is Saturday, November 22nd, 2014, and our very special guest today is Lisa Thuman. I am Peggy George, and I'm one of the co-moderators of the show, along with Tammy Moore and Lori Moffitt. We are thrilled to have Lisa Thuman here with us today. It actually turns out that Lisa was one of our very first presenters when we first started our show, and we're now about to celebrate our sixth anniversary. So Lisa presented on Google Search Tips way back in June 2009. And so many things have changed with Google over the years. And so we started talking about what we'd like to do to update people on the many things happening with Google. And we have a Classroom 2.0 Live Advisory Team. Some of you may not be aware of that, but we meet once a month and we always brainstorm ideas for topics and special presenters and uh, do that based on the requests that come from the surveys that you complete. So many people were asking about more, more, more for Google. And when we started talking about it, there was one name that came up all the time, and that was Lisa Thuman. She is my Google guru. And when I was in a webinar uh, a few weeks ago with Michelle Atala, on EdWeb, she was doing a Google presentation and she said, if I can't answer your questions, the person I always go to and my Google guru is Lisa Thuman. So we knew right away that's who we had to ask and we're so grateful that Lisa agreed to be our presenter. Lisa was formerly a case technology teacher, and she's been offering technology integration professional development since 2002. Lisa worked as Rutgers University Senior Specialist in Technology Education and Keene University as director, Assistant Director of Emerging Learning Technologies until she joined the EdTech team this year. Lisa oversees the EdTech team's professional development offerings in the eastern United States, and she works with districts and organizations to customize workshops and events. Lisa is a Google certified teacher and an authorized Google education trainer. She has presented at 10 of the Google Teacher Academies, and presents at conferences, workshops, and national conventions to show us all how to integrate Google Apps and other emerging and engaging technologies into the classroom. So thank you so much, Lisa, for being with us today. And I'd like to ask you to answer our newbie question and then take over with your presentation. So our newbie question is, what is Gaffe or Google Apps for Education. So take it away, well, Lisa. Peggy, before I answer the newbie question, um, I just want to say I'm sitting here blushing. You're always, you know, tremendously uh, complimentary of me, and I really appreciate it. And I'm I'm happy to be back on Classroom 2.0 Live. Uh, newbie question. You know, believe it or not, even though there's over 30 million people in Google Apps Education Edition, there are still lots of people that aren't using it and don't know what it is. And yes, I did say 30 million students and teachers. So Google Apps for Education Edition, in layman's terms, because that's the only way I can explain it, is a web-based suite of free applications. And the benefits behind these free applications is that they are browser and device agnostic. So finally, we have found applications, uh, you know, Google Docs, Google Drive, Google Presentations, building websites, all these things that will work on an iPad, an iPhone, an Android, a tablet, a laptop, a desktop, using any browser that you want. 
And uh, that just, that's so cost effective for schools and it gets teachers and students collaborating and communicating with each other. Uh, I was telling Peggy before the show that, you know, some people pronounce this acronym GAFE, GAFE, GAF. It all depends upon where you live and who uses it the most. So uh, you guys call it whatever you want, but we all know that it's Google Apps for Education. Okay, so I'm going to go on to the next slide. And uh, when Peggy contacted me and asked me to do a presentation, she talked about Google Drive and Google Classroom. And I said, you know what? There's just so much that has happened since June 2014. And here we are. I can't believe it's November already. But there's so much that's happened that let's do those 20 need-to-know features you just got to know about and that you should be using. And, and most of the features I'm going to show you are new. But, you know, I put some oldies but goodies in there as well because there's just some things that have been around a long time, like custom search engines, that people really aren't using or aren't aware of. So uh, we're going to go in order, and, and I need to do a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, as Peggy mentioned, I'm an authorized Google Education Trainer. I was the second person in the world to become one back in August 2010. And I'm also a Google Certified Teacher. Um, I was in the second cohort back in February 2007, and that's really why I just kind of been so involved with Google Apps because I started way back when Google Apps started getting a little bit of traction. Um, these are programs that you can apply for. And, you know, I'm sure we'll talk more about it at the end when we open it up um, to the group for questions. But if you go to google.com slash edu or education, and I'm sure Peggy will put it in the chat for us, um, you can learn more about these programs. So, one of the biggest questions, and we're not even getting to the first of the 20 yet, but one of the biggest questions that I get from folks is how in the world do you keep up with stuff? And um, that's a really, really good question because there is so much coming out all the time. And I know Peggy's going to put it in the chat for us, uh, the links. But um, the first one, uh, there's three things that I use to stay on top of things besides Twitter, okay? Yes, I still use Twitter and Google Plus to stay up to date. But the first one is this newsletter that now Google sends out every month religiously. And uh, these newsletters are great. You know, you can get them in your inbox. You'll see them tweeted out. And they'll show you all of, all of the different um, things that have been updated recently. The second source that I use is the app show on YouTube. This is a great one, especially for those of you that don't want to read about it, you want to see it happen, go ahead and subscribe to the app show. And I gave, uh, put that link in the, the chat already. And then the third one, and this is an important one, especially if you're the go-to person in your school district, you want to go to the Google Apps Update Alerts and subscribe by email. Almost every morning, there is an email from Google saying either this is released today, this is going to be released today. So when you see folks out on Twitter or, you know, chatting in the lunchroom or something like that, like, oh, did you hear that, you know, Google Drive has new landing pages? They found that out most likely through the Google Apps Update Alert. And it's just a fantastic way to stay on top of things. All right, so oh, let me go back one slide. So I really did it. I created a list of 20, well, actually 19, the 20th one you guys are going to help me out with. Um, I have links for almost all of them, but we're going to start going right through them. And that first one in the list is unlimited storage in Google Drive. And, um, you know, we'll put the, the chat right in there. But for those of you that remember, we, we were really excited as educators about having 30 gigabytes of storage. Well, now it's truly unlimited. No more worrying about if you have too much mail or too many files in Google Drive. Now, this only applies to your Google Apps Education Edition account, not a Gmail account. So if you have an account that's been provisioned by your school, you have unlimited storage. And that is big news, recent October big news. The next thing that I wanted to mention was these new landing pages. So it's pretty cool, and we'll put the link in the chat for you. There's a link, a specific link for Google Docs 
and for Google Slides and for Google Sheets where you can see just those. And it's just a really nice um, to have. And if you're using a mobile device, on the mobile device you have an app for each of those uh, applications as well. Next, we want to talk about Google Drive view details. And for this one, I think I'm going to do some screen sharing. So let me go ahead and I'm going to share my Chrome browser. And if I go in here in my Chrome browser into Google Drive, and um, in the right-hand corner, you'll see a black circle with an I in it. And that's the Details button. And if I toggle that on and off, I'll see recent things that have been updated, that they've shared collaborators. So if I go and I click the Recent Filter, and I go ahead and I search on this Kuwait proposal, I'll see, and I'll toggle it on and off again for you, but this is really nice. So, you know, my colleague Jim made an edit, my colleague Mark made an edit, my colleague Tara made an edit, and it's really nice to see that, especially, you know, if you're not using a learning management system uh, and you want to kind of easily keep tabs on those things, well, that's a great way to do that. So let's come on back to the whiteboard. You need to be aware of that. And, oh, this is awesome, guys. Editing image in Google Slides. Well, I'm going to show you this in two places. I'm going to show you it in slides, and I'm going to show you it in Docs. Let's go back to screen sharing, and let's look at Docs first. Now, this is huge. So I'm going to go new, and I'm going to open up a Google Doc. And I'm going to go ahead and insert an image. So insert image. I'll search for one, and I'll search for puppies. And, oh, my gosh, this one is so cute. Now, there's a couple things that I can do with images in Google Docs now. And we're waiting impatiently for that image to load. I'm sure, there we go. Okay. Now, if I click on the image, I get those regular handles that I've gotten in the past where I can resize it. But if I double click on the image, I can now crop images right in Google Docs. I'm going to hit the Enter button and check this out as well. I can put them askew. So that's a nice new feature. Now, having said that, I'm sure you're thinking, oh, you know, oh, here we go. We have a Google Docs landing page. And actually what I want is I want Google Drive. I'm going to do a new presentation because images in Google Slides has even more features. So let's take this slide here. And we don't need to see anything with images. So we're going to click Cancel. And oh my goodness, my computer is not happy with me. I'm doing too much clicking too quickly. I'm going to go ahead and apply just a blank layout. And I'm going to go ahead and insert an image. Now wait till you see the different things you can do with this. So I'm going to do insert image. I'm going to go ahead and do that same search for puppies. And uh, this, oh my goodness, that one is so adorable. So we're going to put that image in. Now, same thing. I've got my handle so that I can resize. If I double click on it, I can crop that image. Okay, so everything that I was able to do in Google Docs, but let me hit enter. Now I have more. Because when I click on an image, I get an image options button. I'm going to click Image Options, and guys, this is awesome. I can make some edits, okay? Uh, I'll go back and I'll do black and white. I can change the transparency. I can change the brightness. I can change the, cross, the contrast. And then I can reset, uh, readjust, readjust back to where I started. So here I am back at my original dog. So to be honest, that's just pretty darn cool that now you don't have to open up a third-party application in order to um, make edits in your Google Docs. Let's go back to the whiteboard. Uh, so that was, let's see, that was number four in the list. Let's go on to number five. We all saw Google add-ons being added when we looked at Google Docs and Google Spreadsheets. But now there's add-ons in Google Forms. And the one that I want to bring your attention to the most is the GMAT tool. So if you're looking for add-ons in Google Forms, and let me go ahead and screen share again. So we're going to share my Chrome browser. 
I'm going to go into a Google form and I'm going to go to add-ons, get add-ons, and here I've got a whole library of them, but this is the one that I want you to be aware of. It's GMAP for form. And if you look at the preview there, you can now go ahead and add an equation or a mathematical expression in a Google form without having to use a third party to add it as an image. Awesome. Amazing. Okay. While we're on the topic of Google Forms, we're going to talk about number six on my list, which is customizing the themes. So in the past, you had about, you know, a dozen themes to pick from. We're going to go ahead and you can see I've already played with this form here. There's the puppy that I was using. But let's look at this. We're going to actually, we're going to do new form and start from beginning. And I'm going to go ahead, and if I view this form right now, it's very plain looking. So you see, I'm titled form, white background, black text. Now let's click change theme. And we're going to go scroll on the right hand side and find one of these cool themes to pick from. I'll go ahead and get this geometrical pattern. But here's the thing. Now we can click customize. And not only, and wait, there should be a drum roll to this one, not only can we go into the title, pick a different font, and change the size, oh, we were already on extra large, we'll go ahead and make it medium so that you can see the difference, um, but we can change the colors in here, so we'll go with blue, we can go into the form background, and we can pick a different color if we needed to do that. We can do a page background. So you'll see the existing page background right now is black. Well, I can go ahead and put an image there. So that's where we got the puppy from. So I can go ahead and, oops, I have to spell it right though. It's kind of mandatory. So I go ahead and I get puppies. And I pick, uh, oh, well, there's that cute guy that I like so much. And he'll be the background on my page. Isn't that nice, all tiled? But, you know, here's where you really want to look at. You want to look at the format on the question. So we've got untitled question one. We can make that, um, you know, red if we needed to, and extra large. And that's been a big concern that I've heard from teachers, that they're really looking for the font to be larger and to be able to differentiate by color between the question itself and the help text. So, you know, changing themes on forms is huge. Let's go back to edit questions. Because number seven on my list for Google um, for our presentation today is that if you're in a Google Apps Education Edition domain and you require your students or your colleagues to sign in with their domain account and you automatically collect their domain account address, then you can do this fourth one in the list, which is Brandy New only allow one response per person. Now, this is great because so many uh, teachers, you know, are concerned that students are going to uh, submit more than once and then they feel like they have to go and they have to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to go back here, that they have to go back and um, sort it in the spreadsheet and make sure that there aren't duplicate answers. Well, it's great because now they don't. So here we are back at the slideshow, and uh, we talked about add-ons for Google Forms. We talked about the themes, and don't forget there's links to all of this in the chat. And we talked about limit one response per person. Notice that one right under the red arrow there, let me just point to that for you, that we've got shuffle the question order. If you're not using page-based answers and you want every student to have a different order of the questions, that's a really great feature to be able to use. All right, this is the big one. Uh, in, let's see, when would the suggested edits come out? Um, so, I don't have the date on it, but it was, pre it was pretty much, I think it was the end of June when ISTE was going on. Google introduced suggesting or suggested edits, and this is a little bit different. Here's the thing about suggesting. Play around with it when you can. It's a little different than commenting, and it's meant to mimic Microsoft Word track changes. And here's the cool thing that you need to be aware of. If you have a Microsoft Word document and you import it and change it over to a Google Doc, 
any track changes you have in the Microsoft Word document will be suggested edits in the Google document. And you know it's coming if you're working in Google Docs using suggested edits. And you export it as a DOC so that you can open it up in Microsoft Word. Your suggested edits will also become Microsoft Word track changes. Okay, so. The next thing that we want to talk about is we want to talk about Google Docs sharing settings. Now, I'm going to go ahead and screen share again because it's really important uh, that you're aware of this. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share my browser again and I'm going to go into a document. Okay, so we all know that we can click the blue share button in a Google Doc. We also know that we can click advanced. And we can see the different people that are on a document. So you'll see, since I use my EdTech team account so much, that um, I use my, uh, whenever I create a document, I share it with my Gmail or vice versa. Uh, okay, so I'm not the owner of this document, so I can't demonstrate on this one. Don't you hate it when you plan something and it doesn't work the way you want it to? No big deal. We open up another doc to demonstrate. This is when we see the real difference between what an owner can do and an editor can do. Notice that LisaEdTechTeam.com is the owner. Down at the bottom, the owner always has this choice down here. Editors will be allowed to add people and change the permissions. I can change it. By default, any editor on a Google Doc, a Google Spreadsheet, a Google Presentation, it carries through to all these things. Any editor added is allowed to add people and change permissions. So they can change the visibility of a document. They can remove people. They can change people from can edit to can comment, things like that. Only the owner can change the default permission for the document so that editors can only edit. They can't change any of the sharing or visibility permissions. And it's really important that we all know that that option is there. Now, I know you're thinking, oh, can this be changed at the domain level? And you're not going to like my answer because my answer is no. At this point in time, that cannot be changed at the domain level. So you would have to go in and do that for each individual document. So you'll see here, this is the one that you would want to check off if you are the owner and you don't want anybody to be able to add or remove or change visibility. All right. Let's go back to Google Docs. I should have stayed there anyway. But I'm going to click Start Sharing again. I have one other thing that I want to show you in Google Docs. Okay, so if I go ahead and I type, um, uh, I am researching turtle habitat, and oops, I spelled wrong. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and highlight habitat. Now, a lot of times, I would want to go ahead and add a hyperlink to the word habitat. And the cool thing is, is at this point in time, you can use Google search right in Google Documents itself. So I can go ahead and I can type turtle habitat and Google searching for it for me. So if I wanted to go ahead and get the doctor's Foster Smith or PetSmart, I could click on one of those. It would give me the actual URL, click apply, and I've got my hyperlink. Now we're going to go into Google Research, you know, Tools Research in just a moment. But I just want to review that one more time. So if I'm typing the U.S. Constitution, I don't have to open the research panel necessarily. I don't have to open another tab and do my research. I can just highlight the word that I am making the hyperlink to. Click the hyperlink button, and it will use it as the search. So you can see here it takes me right to the transcript of the Constitution or the Wikipedia page on the United States Constitution. And I've got my hyperlink right there. All right, so let's now talk about research tools. Peggy, I think at this point we're done. Peggy? Hello. Oh, okay. So uh, now we're going to talk about search in Google Docs, like I said. And uh, 
Well, actually, that's what I just demonstrated for you all. So you'll see that I was talking, you know, Peggy gave me directions on closed captioning, and what I would do is I would type in the text right here, and then it would do that search for me. Okay, now let's go on to the next thing, research in Google Docs. So let's go to the next slide. And we just went over research in Google Docs, and I've already put the link in there for you, but we were already screen sharing. We already talked about the reading level, and I'm not sure I put the link in that. I did put the link uh, for that. Okay, the next one is one of my absolute favorites. The next one that we're going to talk about is Gmail hand responses. Okay, I'm going to ask you to do the voting that Lori did with you in the beginning. If you find yourself sending the same email to multiple people on a regular basis, I want you to click the yes button. But if you don't, if you always just rewrite something unique for every single email that you send through, is I want you to go ahead and click no. And oh no, I don't know where that tabulates. I'm a Google Hangouts user not a Blackboard Collaborate user. So nobody, oh, see, I've got one yes and three no. So let's talk about what I mean. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to screen share again, of course, and I have opened my EdTech team email. I'm going to click Compose, okay? So um, I've got this parent that I'm always, you know, if this parent always emails me on Friday afternoon. So my response to this parent is going to be, you know, dear parents, thank you so much for reaching out to me about your child. I will give this some thought and respond to you in the next couple of days. So that buys me the weekend. It buys me some time to think about it. And here's what I'm going to do. If that's the email, oh, and, and I always find it, you know, regards, Lisa, Suman, technology, teacher, any school, USA. Okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to canned responses, and I'm going to say new canned response. I'm going to name this canned response, put the parent off. Okay, so I've created a canned response. Now that email comes in from that teacher, and I'm going to go ahead and grab, um, I'm going to grab this email here from Evernote. So let's say this is the parent. I click respond. I click respond, and now watch what happens at the bottom of the screen. I click the upside down arrow, I go to canned responses, and I click put the parent off. And then I do not have to retype, I do not have to retype that whole email. Now how in the world did I get to that? What I did is I went in the top right hand corner to settings, I went to labs, and I enabled canned responses. Once you do this, it's going to work so nice for you. And um, I use canned responses for so many different things. I'm going to go, um, there's no link to help you with that, but um, I'm going to go and uh, going to turn application sharing off. Okay. Um, I use canned responses, and I'll have multiple canned responses. So if someone emails me, Lisa, we're really interested in having you come to our district to work with our teachers. And my first canned response is, thank you so much for reaching out to me. I really appreciate it. My second canned response that I put right under it is, you know, would you please fill out this request for a presentation? And then I've got a spreadsheet that collects the information. And then I've got my third canned response that's my signature block. So I've authored this nice, you know, formal email <laughs> without actually typing anything. So for things that you do on a, a regular basis, um, Peggy, you may think you didn't get a canned response when you asked me to present, but you very well may to. So that's, you know, half the battle is writing that canned response so that, you know, people don't really realize that it's canned. Um, the next thing that we want to talk about, we want to talk about the new calendar app. Now, um, let me 
there was actually, I'm, I'm giving you the link to the, the Google Apps update blog that I suggested that you subscribe to. And um, this is pretty cool. The new calendar app, uh, you want to install that on your smartphone. Of course, it came out on Android first, but you're also going to see some of the features of the new calendar app come through on the web-based Google Calendar. And some of the things that you'll see, I want you to be aware of it and I want you to look for them, but I want you to be able to see that photos and maps are automatically coming up. If you look at the notifications on the phone, on the screen in front of you, you'll see, you know, on Monday, you're going here, here's a map to it. On Tuesday, you're going there, there's a map to it, there's the address, there's the calendar. And you'll see that birthdays are popping up here now, and it, it's just a, a, a nice new, um, new interface for uh, you to work with. But speaking of calendar, if you're not familiar with appointment slots, you need to be. And what appointment slots do, and, and we're kind of running out of time, so I'm not going to demonstrate it for you, but I do have a link for you for appointment slots. Now, appointment slots are a Google Calendar feature that is only available in Google App Education Edition. So you won't see this in a Gmail account. And what it does is you'll see that this um, Google Apps Administrator has said, I have office hours on Sunday from 2 to 5, Monday from 3.30 to 6.30, and Tuesday from 5 to 6. If you want to come schedule 15 minutes of time with me, you come and click on my appointment slot. This is great for parent-teacher conferences. This is great if you're advising students and you want to hold office hours. This is even great for your book fair in your school's media center. So. It's one of those old things that's been around since 2010, but so many people are not yet familiar with it. All right, now we're going to stay in the concept of calendar for right now. And one of the things that I want to talk about, and I put the link in there for you, is that you can set your Google Calendar to automatically attach a Google Hangout to any event that you create. And I did this actually, or actually made, I, you'll see here that I created this event with my Gmail account. So let me go grab my little star. So you see I used my Gmail account. Okay, um, what I did when Peggy emailed me asking me is I put the date and everything and I put a hyperlink to the Classroom 2.0 site, but there's also a link right here for join video call. So when people email me, Lisa, I'd like to meet, such as that, I do 90% of my meetings in Google Hangouts. And then I can just tell people, great, I'm going to send you a calendar advice. And right in there, you'll see the link to join the call. So um, on your calendar itself, in the back end settings, you'll see that you have the option to automatically add video calls to events. You can say yes or no. If you're in a Google Apps Education Edition domain, your domain administrator can set that at the domain le uh, level. So if you don't see that option, it's because somebody has made the decision for you. All right, guys, we're winding down. We're going to get back to Google Classroom here. And, um, you know, Google Classroom was first released in um, the week of August 11th, actually. Um, but October 14th, they, uh, they added, not added features, but added some functionality, additional functionality to it. And I just want to, um, review what that additional functionality is. So the first one is marking assignments are done. I don't know why I'm putting it in chat, but the first one is marking assignments that are done. So it used to be in Google Classroom that the only way a student can indicate that their assignment was done is if they had submitted it via Google Drive. But now you can assign a video, you can assign something that they need to read, and they can still click the mark as done button and um, be able to do that. The other thing that's new as of the week of October 14th is that you can sort your students by first name or last name. And then the other thing is that you guys, the teachers, have additional control in the stream in Google Classroom, meaning that you can set permissions now for who in the class can post or not post. You can mute individual students 
And you can even see things that were deleted from the comment stream. I know that in your head you have a bunch of features that you're waiting for Google Classroom to have, like being able to add a co-teacher and things like that. I'm sure they're coming. Um, Google put this out very quickly, and I think it's a great, it's off to a great start. All right. We're on the last couple of things here, guys. We're on number 18. So I hope you're thinking about number 20 because that number 20 was coming from you guys. I'm going to be looking for it in the chat very soon. Um, what we want to talk about is we want to talk out about the new Google Hangouts Chrome app. Here's a link to it. Um, oh, I hope I gave you guys the right link. Let me check. Uh, no, no, no. The first thing we're going to talk, oh, okay. So we'll do the Hangouts Chrome app first. Here's a link to the Hangouts Chrome app. Uh, you install this. Now, if you guys are using Google Hangouts, oh, thanks, Peggy. If you guys are using Google Hangouts to do chat, to do video, to do audio, you know that it shows up to the right or the left of your Gmail window. Well, with this Chrome app, and I would share my whole desktop with you, but then you'd learn way too much about me. But with this Chrome app, it gets installed in that Chrome app launcher, which is the Rubik's Cube, and it's separate. So you can have Hangouts running to the side without having to have yet another tab open in your screen. So I highly suggest you go ahead and, and you install that app. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention was the Hangouts access link, and um, that's this, this link that I put in prematurely. So we've got that one right there. And uh, what that does, it's pretty cool, is you can now add anybody to a Hangout without having to click this guy right here. So instead of clicking this guy and adding someone by email address, you can now click this button right here next to the name of the Hangout, click Change, and then you can make it so that anybody with the link can join your Hangout. So this is great. You could put that link out on Facebook. You could put it out on Twitter. You can put it out to all staff hoping that 14 people will join your Hangout. And it's really nice to have that option. All right, guys. I have a few more things to say, but I'm looking for that 20th thing. What is that, you know, feature that you just can't live without in Google Apps Education Edition? Oh, great. You can even have the mic if you raise your hand. And I'm going to look at some of these tips. Um, while you guys are doing that, uh, I want to just talk about Deb's comment. I assume that she's talking about switching between her DEEF account and then regular Drive account. And the way that I do that is I add Chrome users. So um, you can actually see that if I screen share just real quickly. Um, I want to show you what that looks like. In the top corner of my window, I've got an icon. And these are all the different Chrome users I use just on this machine. I click New User, and I can go ahead and log in as just, you know, EdTech Team or myself as Gmail or my Marble account or my Matawan account or my Morristown account or my Woodbridge account and not mix things together. So if I go into my Woodbridge account, let me click cancel here. If I go into my Woodbridge account, this stuff is not going to mingle with my Gmail or my EdTech Team stuff, which is really, really nice. And let me go ahead and turn off screen sharing, get back to the whiteboard. So let's see. Um, why don't you see the icon at the top of your screen, Deb? All you have to do is go into your Chrome settings onto that general page, and you will see Add Users. All right, so Paula says she loves Google presentations and publishing size so that everyone can follow along. Um, also, publishing Google Docs. And I'll tell you, I don't even make slides when I go somewhere and do a live presentation, and the reason is is because I use a Google Doc. And, you know, everything's on the Google Doc. Anything that you guys have questions about, we can add to the Google Doc. And then that's their doc to make a copy of, to email to themselves, anything like that. Okay? Um, 
Oh, Google Alerts best. That's a really good one. I have alerts set on my name, on my <laughs> my kids' names. Um, I have an alert set on their school, and I'll actually tell um, Google Alerts. I'll get information from Google Alerts if there's a snow day or something like that before I get that phone call from the school. So. Um, Yes, Google Alert is a lifesaver, Glenn. It really, really is a big help. So a couple of things. Let's see, we're on slide 40. Oh, well, before we get to that, a couple of things that I wanted to add in. Um, first of all, you guys have my contact information. You can reach me at Lisa at edtechteam.com. You can follow me on Twitter if you want, L. Um but um, thanks, Lori. <laughs> but um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is if you're in the New Jersey, if you're in the New Jersey area, um, we have the GAFE Summit, which is the Google in Education Summit, um, coming up in March. And oh, I guess it's not a hyperlink if I do that. Peggy, if you could fix that one for me, that would be great. Um, and what I do with EdTech Team is I organize professional development all over the world. So if you need somebody to come into your school to do Google Apps Education Edition or anything along those lines, it could be me, it could be someone else from the team. But that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. And then I also help um, organize and run the GEEF Summit. So I saw there were a couple people in here from Canada. There's, uh, there's some summits coming up in Canada, uh, all over the world. And um, please contact me directly if you have any questions of what we went over today or if you just want to say hi. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. I will begin with some of the questions I captured from the chat as it went along. Uh, someone wants to get more info on becoming Google Admin certified, or more, more info on the benefits of, be of getting Google Admin certified. So the Google Admin certification is a very technical certification. When you're taking those exams online, you actually have to have a webcam and they need to see that it's actually you taking it. Um, that certification, you know, that's a great way uh, if you're running a domain um, to, to network with the other people that are running domains that are very technical, mm -hmm. whereas the authorized Google Education Trainer is more about professional development. So um, if you go to google.com slash edu, there's a whole section there on training. Okay, great. Let's go back to my list here. I think this goes along with the docs in Drive. Will it show if someone simply opens? That is the, the history, I think. Well, what a great question. If they just open it, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go into my drive without, you know, doing the screen share or anything. Mm -hmm. And um, if I go to my drive, it'll pull up activity on, like, the most recent file. I don't think it shows you, let's see, I'll try recent instead or incoming. You know, that's one of those things that you don't know until you actually take a look at it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe it shows you if, if someone just opened it. It's just if they made some type of change. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to go with that answer, but that okay. I would have to Google it. <laughs> okay, okay. Fair enough. Um, let's, um, our image okay. options that you showed us only available in slides, not documents? Oh, great question. Okay, so um, I showed you it in Google Docs and then in Google Slides. In right. Google Slides, there are more options to work with. Okay. In Google Docs, it's merely cropping and um, putting it askew. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Will you explain the difference between a Google Apps for Every Education account and a regular Google account? 
absolutely. A regular Google account is owned by you. You own the data, not Google, okay? Mm -hmm. if that account is not automatically linked with any, anybody else, any other organization. It is just you unless you specifically share out. It also doesn't have the management features that a Google Apps Education account does. Now, a Google Apps Education Edition account is provisioned by the school the school owns the contents of that account. So if I create something in lisa.fumina at gmail.com, I create a presentation, I own it. Mm -hmm. I create a presentation in my Woodbridge School District account, Woodbridge they School own District it. owns it. Yeah, and they can, they can't see my password, but they can change my password, they can suspend my account, they can see my documents, my calendar, everything like that. So that account okay. is owned and managed by somebody else. This one just came in. What's the difference between a Google educator by taking the exams and the Google certified teacher by attending the GTA? Great question. So this new term Google educator means that you have passed these five exams and gotten a PDF certificate. They give you a little badge that you can use. It ends there. Mm -hmm. um, in order to apply to be an authorized Google Education Trainer or really to be considered for the Google Teacher Academy, you have to have that certificate. Mm. It shows commitment and it shows a, a knowledge base, okay? Um, mm -hmm. But you're not certified to do anything. You're just, uh, you just took the exam. Um, okay. You haven't been put through an application process. Wow, Lucien said that there's 20,000 teachers going to use Google Apps Education Edition in Romania. <laughs> awesome. Anything else? Yes, I do have some more. Um, this came up when you were showing the difference between uh, the owner editing the document and other people, I think. The, the, the fault was one thing. And this person asked, can the choice, can that choice be changed by default as far as what the default is? What a great question. No. Um, at the current time, the default can't be changed from any editors can manage sharing. You would have to go into the document and manually change it so that only the owner can manage sharing. There's no way at the domain level to change the default. Okay. And I just want to answer something in the chat. No, not only Google educators can attend a Google Teacher Academy. In order to attend a Google Teacher Academy, you have to apply. And all of the requirements for that are at google.com slash edu. I could do a whole other Saturday show on the requirements of all these different things. It's one of my conference presentations, actually. Um, but it is recommended when applying to the Google Teacher Academy that you have passed those exams and have that Google Educator um, a certificate. It's recommended, not mandatory. Somebody asked, can you transfer ownership of a document to another user? Great that question. is, as someone who is leaving a school or wants to transfer document ownership to their okay. replacement? So technically, you cannot transfer ownership from one domain to another. So if I made everything in my gmail.com account, I couldn't transfer it to my EdTech team account. What I would have to do is I would have to share it with that other account, and then that account could make a copy of it, and they'd be an owner of the new copy. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a couple of third-party things that you can do to get everything out of Google. Google hasn't made it impossible, but you cannot transfer from one domain to another. Transfer ownership. Here were some recent ones. Is there a way to save the comments I make on a student's slides from one session to the next? From one session to the next? I don't get that. This was Karen who asked the question. Is Karen still in the room? Maybe yeah, Karen can clarify. History, so the, the comments are archived as that's part of revision history. Right. That, that's in revision history already. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, can you talk about how you oh you already did this about moving between different Google accounts? I did, um, yeah. What if you stay in the domain? Yes, Patty, within the domain, so you and I are both in anyschool.org. Okay, and I have a document and I transfer ownership to your anyschool.org account. Absolutely. Just not from one domain to another. Is there a demo site of Google Classroom for those who don't have no. GAFE yet? No. No, there's no demo. Um, I actually, so being an authorized Google Education Trainer, mm -hmm. we all set up, and Google approves them for us, we set up a sandbox accounts mm -hmm. so that we can play with these things. So I pay oh, for okay. our domain. Yeah, and, and, and that's really the only way to do it. Okay. I keep seeing the same question, what are the benefits of being Google yeah. certified? And I want to answer that one. Okay, one, go ahead. Part of an elite community, um, you know, like Wes Fryer and, and I are both Google certified teachers. When I have a question, I don't typically Google the answer. I go to the help pages, and if I can't figure it out then, then I go to my fellow Google certified teachers or my fellow Google education trainers. So we have a private Google community, and we have a private Google group. We're also invited by Google to present at conferences, to come to the offices. I mean, that's how I wound up presenting at Google Teacher Academies. Um, I'm pretty lucky I was in the right place at the right time. And here's a little bit more about the um, revision history. Each week, my kids read my comments and revise their work on a collaborative project. I would like to review their progress over the four-week period. So would that all be in the revision history? Yes. Yeah. 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 The revision history is since the it starts right when the document's created. Mm -hmm. And it's color coded. So how easy is migration to gate email accounts from school based domain email accounts? It's not difficult. Um, you can you know, there's there's lots of help pages um, on how to do this. If you need help, you can contact me, and I'll put you in touch with one of our technical deployment people. It's not difficult at all. I've set up many domains. Let's see if I have any others in the chat. Yeah, Hapara Teacher Dashboard is an excellent product. So it's Promevo. And um, Google Classroom is great for those schools that weren't using any type of learning management system. Um, so before they, you know, invested in some of the amazing, um, and then I want to answer Deb's question. Um, the, there's these amazing features of the paid services, but if you're just getting started, Google Classroom will, will be beneficial. Uh, Deb, the boot camps, um, if they're boot camps that are run by EdTech teams, um, and me, uh, then yes, they'll prepare you to take the exam and they'll also go through application tips for you. I think I finished the questions I was able to capture. Great. Thanks so much, Lisa. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you, Lisa. That was awesome. And we so appreciate having those first-hand tips from you. And we just want to take a minute to say we have some great shows coming up. But do remember that we don't have a show next weekend because that's the Thanksgiving weekend in the U.S. But we're going to do a great show on Hour of Code on December 6th. December 13th, you're going to get to hear all about class flow, which is an amazing free tool. Um, and Stephen Anderson will be sharing that. Then we'll take a winter break and be back for our big celebration, January 10th. I hope you'll all join us for our sixth anniversary celebration. So thank you all so much for joining us today. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's newest endeavor. He's gathered all his PD resources all in one place, including the Host Your Own webinar. And as long as you make the session in a Collaborate Classroom 
public, you can get a free uh, Collaborate Classroom to use. You can nominate a featured teacher by filling out the form here, tinyurl.com, CR2O Live Featured Teacher Nominate without the E at the end. And you can nominate yourself as a featured teacher as well. Each month, usually, there's a featured teacher. As you exit this, the session, the Classroom 2.0 Live survey should open in your browser. The survey uh, link will be in chat. There it is. Peggy's already put it there. Um, it's also in the Live Binder. Um, so are, there are numerous places to get the link for the survey. At the bottom of that survey, you can request a professional development certificate. And if you choose to do this, please make sure you put a personal email in the area for an email address because these tend to get lost and not accepted by school email accounts. And what's new is that your name prints out on the, the, in the certificate itself now. Also, the archives are available at iTunes U in both a video collection and an audio collection. So there are other ways to access recordings. There's also an RSS feed. If you'd rather get the show archives by RSS feed, you can get to that from the Classroom 2.0 live site. Again, special thanks to Lisa Thuman, our special guest today, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our website, and to everyone who participated in today's show, thank you all for coming.